All right, so uh, we are now at the part of uh, the section in chapter two called Transition of the Finite into the Infinite. Uh, do we need to cover what we did last week? Just do a little review. Uh, I did a quick read now, but um, yeah, sure. Maybe to clarify it more because. I think this chapter, uh, the, the, this part is uh, in connection with other parts, so. All right, well, I'll just quickly uh, define what the, the whole, uh, what was it, the ought and restriction. Uh, the ought and restriction are two sublations of... Uh, the unity of limit and something, or another way to phrase that is the unity of limit and determination. So the ought is the negative moment of uh, determination against limit, which is limit, which is that determination limits limit. It is the restriction of limit, and the concept of restriction is from the standpoint of limit as a uh, against determination in which limit is well what limits determination it is a restriction of determination so determination is what restriction or limit ought to be and restriction is what determination or the ought ought to be uh, the restricted is considered uh, the negative being of what is. But likewise, so is the ought. So both of them are supposed to be things that aren't, and yet at the same time, they are. And uh, this has problems. So, you know, the ought is what should be, but can never be. And in so being, the fact that it should be, but can never be, and yet it is what should be, uh, you have this problem that which what shouldn't be, or what isn't, actually is. Because what ought to be is, is. Well, I mean, that's that's the only way I can say it. What ought to be is. And uh, as far as restriction, what is restricted is not restricted because in being restricted, it immediately goes beyond itself. To be restricted is to go beyond a limit because that which restrict is already beyond what is restricted. So uh, I don't know if that was clear yeah maybe i i i um what sounds to me like um uh, it has more of the same in that sense maybe but it, it has it can be um uh, understood by moral connotations, but I'm I'm not sure. But uh, uh, when you say about morals, they uh, ought is uh, practically a restriction. You, you, uh, uh, every moral has to like have at least in Ger uh, German idealism has to, uh, it's it's uh, conceived like ne negative, not positive. In, se in sense that it it's fo formal, it only restricts activity. Yeah, you can think about it moral, but here Hegel's making it ontological. So the, I mean, think about it, uh, it's literally a repetition of the structure of being in itself and being for other, in which each is the non-being of the other. So being in itself is the non-being of being for other, and being for other is the non-being of being in itself. So, sorry, dogs barking. Um, so here, the the restriction is the non-being of what ought to be, and the ought to be is the non-being of restriction. And uh, just like how being in itself and being for other are two aspects 
of a qualitative being. Here it is also two aspects of limited being. Uh, limited something, you know, the finite. So uh, restriction, a restricted something is something which is limited, so it's it's the application of limit to determination. But what ought to be is the something beyond the limit. So, you know, it, it does go with the regular idea of the ought as, you know, something that should be, but is not yet. So something that's beyond. Okay, it, it makes more sense in this way, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it does make sense. But it definitely has to do a lot more with the, the specificity of uh, how this relates to finitude. Yeah, I'm. I'm not really sure about Ott and um, how. In what sense does he say that it has restriction, like Ott, in that sense, and that also in also in in uh, in other moment it goes beyond infinity, uh, be, 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 uh, goes beyond the limit, finite. Uh, think about it as as an image, and you know you have let's say uh, a circle. You know, and there's a, made of a line. The line is the limit. The sides of the inside and the outside of the circle, those empty surface areas, that's the ought or the the determination. The determination is beyond the limit. So it's the negative. It's the negative to the limit. You know, it's the limit of the limit. That is what the ought is. The restriction is the limit applied to the determination or the inside or the outside in which it sets, I mean, exactly what it says, it sets the limit towards which it reaches. But in order to have that limit, there has to be an actual otherness to it. You know, the other, it's like the other of the other. You know, you really do have to have that other. But if you have that other, then you have two others, right? Because you can't have just a oh, single okay. other. Okay, so, so it g goes beyond. Okay, so, so it uh, in some way it goes beyond limit, but it has limit itself. Yes. Okay, great. So the beyond of limit, because it is beyond, is also limited because it is a beyond. So if it was just the beyond, it would be limited. And since we usually take the ought to be exactly this, just a beyond, it can never actually be. What ought to be can never be, then it is limited. So you see the unity. It's always a unity between both both limit, well, no, restriction, and the ought, or two faces of the same thing, just like how being in itself and being for other are just two faces of the same thing. So hopefully that clarifies it. Um, otherwise, just uh, listen to, the, to that recording. Uh, we definitely uh, went into it to a good detail. So all right. Uh, I always forget the Greek letters here. That's like gamma. Page yeah. Right. Yeah. Gamma transition of the finite into the infinite. The ought contains restriction explicitly for itself, and restrictions contain the ought. Their mutual connection is the finite itself, which contains them both in its in itself. These moments of its determination are qualitatively opposed. Restriction is determined as the negative of the ought, and the ought equally as the negative of restriction. The finite is thus in itself the contradiction of itself. It sublates itself. It goes away and ceases to be. So the finite is supposed to be, uh, you know, this purely negative thing, uh, you know, as opposed to the infinite, you know, inf uh, uh, what you asked earlier, and now I remember what, what I was saying, Ed, that the infinite is supposed to be pure affirmation or pure being, while the finite is considered purely non-being, you know, it doesn't really exist. 
Um, think about this in the way of like a monism, in which monists say, well, you know, the only thing that really exists is the whole, the one. You know, all the other differences and changes that you see, they're illusions. You know, they don't really exist. So the finite does not really exist. You know, it's, it exists for us because, you know, we, are, we suffered illusions of cognition. But it doesn't really exist. And so since the, since the finite is this pure negative and it's made of two negative sides, uh, just like mathematics, what does a negative times a negative make? Well, it makes a positive, it makes an affirmation. So the finite undoes itself, you know. If, it's, if it is a negative, then the negative negates itself. Continuing, but this, its result, the negative as such, is alpha, its very determination, for it is the negative of the negative. So, in going away and ceasing to be, the finite has not ceased. It has only become momentarily an other finite, which equally is, however, a going away as going over into another finite, and so forth to infinity. But, beta? That's, is that beta? Yeah. Okay. But beta, if we consider this result more closely, in its going away and ceasing to be, in this negation of itself, that finite has attained its being in itself. In it, it has rejoined itself. So, I mean, that's just going over the usual way that we think about infinity, which is infinity we think is just the endless repetition of the finite, you know, one finite to another finite to another finite. So it's interesting, he says, uh, to repeat that, uh, if we consider this result more closely and it's going away and ceasing to be in this negation of itself, the finite has attained its being in itself. In it, it has rejoined itself. Each of its moments contains precisely this result. The ought transcends the restriction that is, it transcends itself, but its beyond or its other is only restriction itself. Restriction for its part immediately points beyond itself to its other, and this is the ought. But this ought is the same diremption of in itselfness and determinateness as its restriction. It is the same thing. In going beyond itself, restriction thus equally rejoins itself. So, you know, he says uh, the art transcends the restriction. That is, it transcends itself, but it's beyond or its other is only restriction itself. So the transcendence of restriction is, well, another restriction. <laughs> and also the same thing, restriction is just like limit, something that immediately goes beyond itself. You know, to be a restriction is to have a beyond of the restriction. And since the beyond is the beyond of the restriction, it's the restriction of the restriction. So it is this ought is the same direction of in itselfness and determinateness as its restriction. It is the same thing and going beyond itself, restriction thus equally rejoins itself. So like I was you know, just like we just mentioned uh, a little bit ago, uh, they're identical in a way. You know, restriction, the ought is nothing but the restriction of restriction and restriction is nothing but the art of the art. So this identity with itself, the negation of negation, is affirmative being, is thus the other of the finite, which is supposed to have the first negation for its determinateness. This other is the infinite. So, you know, this is just like how uh, we've seen in prior forms of sublation, uh, this negation of negation, this self-repulsion and self-opposition repeats here. We get that the ought and the restriction are actually identical, and yet they are not identical and they're opposed. So, you know, there's, it's like the issue of the other of the other, it's thus opposed to itself, and in this unity we take them both together and we get the infinite. Uh, clear enough?
Yes, no questions. Ivan? No, oh, okay, we can go on. Eric, right, can you continue? All right, C, infinity. Okay, everything's important. <laughs> But uh, this one's really important because, um, just to give something away, this is the very first form of the complete structure of the universal, but not explicitly as the concept. But it has the necessary basic structures of the concept. All right. So the infinite, in its simple concept, can be regarded first of all. Wait a second. Uh -huh. Your mic's doing that thing. Oh, crap. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Does it sound better? It's still deep. All right. Let me check something. Let me see All if right. this is disc or if it's actually my mic. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, so no, it's my mic. Man. I wonder what it happens. I don't know. Yeah, let me disconnect it real quick. Hello? All right, now it's fixed. Okay. All right, thanks. I gotta find out what that would, what that happens. Yeah. All right, C infinity. The infinite and simple concept can be regarded, first of all, as a fresh definition of the absolute, as self-reference devoid of determination. It is posited as being and becoming. The forms of existence have no place in the series of determinations that can be regarded as definitions of the absolute, since the forms of that sphere are immediately posited for themselves only as determinacies, as finite in general. Yeah, so it's interesting. There's a, a difference between existence and this. But the finite is accepted unqualifiedly as absolute. Oh, but the infinite is accepted unqualifiedly as absolute since it is explicitly determined as a negation of the finite, the restrictedness to which being and becoming would somehow be susceptible even if they do not have it or exhibit it. 
is thereby both explicitly referred to and denied in it. All right, continuing. But in fact, by justice negation, the infinite is not already free from restricting its infinitude. It is essentially to distinguish the true concept of infinity. It is essential to distinguish the true concept of infinity from bad infinity, the infinite of reason from the infinite of the understanding. The latter is in fact finitized infinite. And as we shall now discover, in wanting to maintain the infinite pure and distant from the finite, the infinite is, by that very fact, only made finite. The infinite A. In simple determination is the affirmative as negation of the finite. B. Is thereby in alternating determination with the infinite and is abstract. <laughs> Dang dogs. B. But there but is thereby in alternating determination with the infinite and is abstract, one-sided infinite. C is the self-sublation of this infinite and of the finite in one process. This is the true infinite. So fair enough. Thing of interest right there is that the, the uh, term infinitized infinite, which is what our normal conception of the infinite is, you know, the otherwise in other translations they call this uh, the bad infinite or the spurious infinite, the infinite that just keeps on, it's nothing but the endless repetition of the finite. And I think also important there is to note that the infinite is not a thing in the usual way, and we normally understand that. But it's also not a relation of the finite to the finite. It's more than just the uh, mere relation, it's the process of the finite. Uh, just as he says, it's the self sublation or the self transcendence of the finite. That is what the true infinite really is. So, um, A, the infinite in general. Could you uh, read for a bit, Hyperion? Yeah, sure. The infinite is the negation of negation, the affirmative. Being that has reinstated itself out of restrictedness. The infinite is, in a more intense sense than the first immediate being. It is the true being the elevation above restriction. At the mention of the infinite, soul and spirit light up, for in the infinite the spirit is at home. And not only abstractly, rather it rises to itself, to the light of its thinking, its universality, its freedom. What is first given with the concept of the infinite is this, that in its being in itself, existence is determined as finite and transcends restriction. It is the very nature of the infinite of of the finite that it transcend itself, that it negate its negation and become infinite. Consequently, the infinite does not stand above the finite as something ready made by itself, as if the finite stood fixed outside or below it. Nor is it we only, as a subjective reason, who transcend the finite into the infinite. As if, in saying that the infinite is a concept of reason, and that through reason we elevate ourselves above things temporal, we did this without prejudice to the finite, without this elevation, which remains external to the finite, affecting it. Insofar as the finite itself is being elevated to infinity, it is not at all an alien force that does this for it. It is rather its nature to refer itself to itself as restriction, both restriction as such and as ought, and to restriction, uh, sorry, to transcend this restriction, or rather, in this self-reference, to have negated the restriction and gone above and beyond it. 
It is not in the sublation of the finite in general that infinity in general comes to be, but the finite is rather just this, that through its nature it comes to be itself the infinite. Infinity is its affirmative determination, its vocation, what it truly is in itself. The finite has thus vanished into the infinite, and what is, is only the infinite. So, definitely the thing to take there is that the infinite and the finite are not opposed. And as a matter of fact, one of the curious things, uh, and I got this uh, more so from uh, uh, Alan Ponikbar's comments, in which uh, he makes it very clear and uh, actually does become clear with uh, the idea. This is also accounts for the concept as well, the idea of the Hegelian concrete universal, which is the infinite could only have ever been finite. It has to exist as a finite thing. It's like only something finite that's truly finite could actually be infinite. Definitely something uh, strange to the common understanding. Yeah, all right, go on. B. Alternating, alternating determination of finite and infinite. The infinite is. In this immediacy, in this immediacy, it is at the same time, the negation of an other, of the finite, and so, as existent, and at the same time as the non-being of another, it has fallen back into the category of the something, of something determinate in general. More precisely, the infinite is the existence reflected into itself, which results from the mediating sublation of determinateness in general, and is consequently posited as existence distinct from its determinateness. Therefore, it has fallen back into the category of something with a limit. In accordance with this determinateness, the finite stands over against the infinite as real existence. They thus remain outside each other, standing in qualitative mutual reference. The immediate being of the infinite resurrects the being of its negation, of the finite again, which seemed at first to have vanished into the infinite. But the infinite and the finite are not in these referential categories only. The two sides are further determined in addition to being as mere others to each other. Namely, the finite is restriction posited as restriction. It is existence posited with the determination that it passes over into what is its in itself and becomes infinite. Infinity is the nothing of the finite, the in itself that the latter ought to be. But it is this, at the same time, as reflected within itself, as realized ought, as only affirmative self-referring being. In infinity we have the satisfaction that all determinateness, alteration, all restriction, and the ought itself together with it, have vanished, are sublated, and the nothing of the finite is posited. As this negation of the finite is the being in itself determined which, as negation of negation, is in itself affirmative. Yet affirmation is qualitatively immediate self-reference, being. And because of this, the affirmative is led back to the category of being that has the finite confronting it as an other. Its negative nature is posited as existent negation, and hence as first and immediate negation. The infinite is, in this way, burdened with the opposition to the finite, and this finite, as an other, remains a real existence, even though in, in its being in itself, in the infinite, it is at the same time posited as sublated. This infinite is that which is not finite, a being in the determinateness of negation. Contrasted with the finite, with the series of existent determinacies, of realities, the infinite is indeterminate emptiness, the beyond of the finite whose being in itself is not in, it, in its existence, which is something determinate. All right, let's stop it there. All right. I think here one of the ways to think about this is um, kind of the monist uh, example that I gave earlier, but 
put a, a metaphysical, theological turn on it. Uh, let's go with the, the usual, uh, the Christian example, in which uh, if you really want to be uh, theologically consistent, in which a God it really is, you know, the God, uh, you got to be like Spinoza, in which you got to say the only, the only real thing at the end is God. It, it's nature or its substance. It doesn't matter what you call it. And that's what the infinite is. You know, we are finite. And we don't have existence in ourselves. We don't have real being in ourselves. Our being is beyond, is something that's actually beyond us and doesn't actually belong to us as such. So the being of the finite is not its own being, but is the being of the infinite. It is the aunt. It itself is not the infinite. But it only exists as a modification of the infinite. So when we think about the infinite in that way, you get these, the strange duality of the, the finite against the infinite, in which uh, as far as I like thinking about it categorially or categorically, we have this opposition, you know, the finite is the true being in itself of, oh, well, I mean that. Uh, the infinite is the true being in itself of the finite. It is the determination. It is the ought, what it ought to be. But which it isn't. But likewise, the finite then is put up against as this negative of the infinite. You know, it's just like the something in other relation in which uh, the something first affirms itself as pure being and the other one as, you know, just the mere absence of its being. But in... Point it, putting itself in that relation, obviously, then the other must have a being in order to actually be the other, to be something beyond. And so that's how finitude becomes uh, finite. I mean, infinitude becomes finite. Um, make more or less sense, uh, Ivan? Yeah, I kind kind of understand. All right. Well, I just want to make sure that you get at least this uh, basic dialectical structure, in which, like, if you put anything against the infinite, then. Categorically speaking, it, it just isn't infinite because if the infinite is supposed to be, the, you know, the all-encompassing, how is it that you can, you can pose the finite against it? That's basically the basic opposition. That if the infinite isn't finite, then that's putting them in opposition, therefore making the infinite finite, and uh, making the finite itself equivalent to the infinite as well. It has just as much being, just as much reality. And so, what's what's the deal? Which was the real one? Which is you know, which is the more real one. Is it that the infinite is actually finite or is it the finite which is actually infinite? Um, so, all right, let's go on. As thus posited over against the finite, the two connected by the qualitative mutual reference to of others uh, the infinite is to be called the bad infinite, the infinite of the understanding, for which it accounts as the highest, the absolute truth. The understanding believes that it has attained satisfaction in the reconciliation of truth, while it is in fact entangled in unreconciled, unresolved, absolute contradictions. And it is these contradictions into which it falls on every side whenever it embarks on the application and explication of these categories that belong to it, that must make it conscious of the fact. The contradiction is present in the very fact that the infinite remains over against the finite, with the result that there are two determinacies. There are two worlds, one infinite and one finite, and in their connection, the f infinite is only the limit of the finite, and thus only a determinate itself finite infinite. This contradiction develops its content into more explicit forms, 
The finite is the real existence which persists as such, even when it has gone over into its non-being, the infinite. As we have seen, this infinite has for its determinateness, over against the finite, only the first immediate negation, just as the finite, as negated, has over against this negation, only the meaning of an other, and is, therefore, still a something. When, therefore, the understanding, elevating itself above this finite world, rises to what, it is, what is the highest for it, to the infinite, the finite would remain, uh, sorry, the finite world remains for it as something on this side here, and thus posited only above the finite. The infinite is separated from the finite, and, for the same reason, the finite from the infinite. Each is placed in a different location. The finite, as existence here, and the infinite, although the being in itself of the finite, there as a beyond, at a nebulous, inaccessible distance outside which there stands, enduring the finite. Keep going. Well, I guess in just repetition of the theological point, if you think about it as, you know, God is yeah. infinite, and, you know, we are the finite, God is of existing God knows where, and, you know, we are here. Mm -hmm. Somehow, you know, we're supposed to think that God is everything or, you know, something just superior, yeah. absolutely superior, and therefore incompatible with infinite, the finite. Something to attain, but something that we haven't, so... Okay. As thus separated, they are just as much essentially connected with each other through the very negation that divides them. This negation connecting them, these somethings reflected into themselves, is the common limit of each over against the other, and that too, in such a way that each does not merely have this limit in it over against the other, but the negation is rather the in-itselfness of each. Each thus has for itself, in its separation from the other, the limit in it. But the limit is the first negation. Both are thus limited, finite, in themselves. Yet, as each affirmatively refers itself to itself, each is also the negation of its limit. Each thus immediately repels the negation from itself as its non-being, and qualitatively severed from it, posits it as an other being outside it. The finite posits its non-being as this infinite, and the infinite likewise the, in the finite. It is readily conceded that the finite passes over into the infinite necessarily, that is, through its determination, and is thereby elevated to what is in itself, what it, what it's in itself, uh, for while the infinite, what is it in itself, for while the infinite, for while the finite is indeed determined as subsistent choice, uh, subsistent existence, it is at the same time also a null in itself and therefore destined to self-dissolution. Whereas the infinite, although burdened with negation and limit, is equally also determined as the existent in itself, so that this abstraction of self-referring affirmation is what constitutes its determination, and hence finite existence is not present, present in it. But it has been shown that the infinite itself attains affirmative being only by the mediation of negation, as negation of negation, and that when its affirmation thus attained is taken as just simple, qualitative being, the negation contained in its demoted, in, in it is demoted to simple, immediate negation, and therefore to determinateness and limit. And these, then, are excluded from the infinite as contradicting its in itself. They are posited as not belonging to it, but rather as opposed to its in itself as the finite. Since each is in it, and through its determination the positing of its other, the two are inseparable. But this unity rests hidden in their qualitative otherness. It is their inner unity, one that lies only at their base. All right. So in this one I was thinking of a another kind of like image example in which like a, what I said earlier about the you know think about the circle line is the limit to uh, the inside and the outside or determinations or the in itself or so when it says that the infinite is the in itself of the finite I mean uh, 
literally it works as that example you know to, the the finite is finite because of the restriction you remove the restriction all you have is the pure in itselfness which is exactly what finite infinitude claims itself to be it claims to negate the restriction negate the line and then all you have is pure content pure determination pure in itselfness pure being in itself but this is only possible by negating that negation you first have to have a negation in order to be speaking of the, the infinite at all you know because here we're not speaking out of out of, of it out of nowhere you know we have to de develop this difference first of all from you know to something and other which began all the way in existence because otherwise it doesn't make sense you know we wouldn't be able to talk about finitude or infinitude at all But uh, yeah, keep going. All right. The manner of the appearance of this unity has thereby been defined. The unity existence as a turning over or transition of the finite into the infinite and vice versa. So that the infinite only emerges in the finite and the finite in the infinite, the other in the other. That is to say, each arises in the other independently and immediately and their connection is only an external one. The process uh, of their uh, transition... Okay. Um, something I hadn't noted before, which is... Uh, the key word here, you know, immediately. Um, one of the differences here is that uh, in, in the logic of being, as opposed to the logic of essence, uh, the, the change just happens uh, without us intending it to or without having to you know define it explicitly so you know in thinking the the infinite we naturally speak of the finite and hey what do you know it it just happened immediately turn into the finite we realize it was already finite and speaking about the finite you know just start talking about the that it you know it's something that has something beyond it. it's like oh wait that's the infinite that just came out of nowhere you know it immediately happens uh, this is opposed to the structures of essence in which uh, you'll have, you know, essence posits appearance, and appearance you know, also posits essence, blah, 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 ground posits grounded, and all those things, you know, cause posits effect. So within those things already their other is posited by them, whereas here it just happens, and it happens that their content immediately is this other. So, uh, something to keep in mind. Yeah, I actually thought of immediate, and where he to to talks that each arises in other independently and immediately, that they arise from themselves, that uh, f infinite arises infinite, but it's not connected to this other concept, that also in infinite arises finite. Uh, it, it's immediate immediately at, uh, as uh, not true something else and also independently yeah you find that uh, in investigating one or the other their opposite comes up and uh, that's where you seem to find their content and so there's a sort of immediate shift that wasn't a was not intended at all. It just happens, and uh, it happens in the back and forth to both of them. So, let's go on. The process of their transition has the following detailed shape. We have the finite passing over into the infinite. This passing over appears as an external doing. In this emptiness beyond the finite, what arises? What is there of positive in it? On account of the inseparability of the infinite and the finite, or because this infinite, which stands apart, is itself restricted, the limit arises. The infinite has vanished, and the other, the finite, has stepped in. But the stepping in of the finite appears as an event external to the infinite, and the new limit as something that does not arise out of the infinite itself, but is likewise found given. And with this, we are back at the previous determination. 
which has been sublated in vain. This new limit, however, is itself only something to be sublated or transcended. And so there arises again the emptiness, the nothing, in which we find again the said determination, and so forth to infinity. That's a good section that I uh, highlighted last time. Okay, do you want me to go on? Yeah. We have before us the alternating determination of the finite and the infinite. The finite is finite only with reference to the ought or the infinite, and the infinite is only infinite with reference to the finite. The two are inseparable, and at the same time absolutely other with respect to each other. Each has in it the other of itself. Each is thus the unity of itself and its other, and, in its determinateness, not to be what itself and what its other is, it is existence. This alternating determination of self-negating, and of negating the negating, is what passes as the progress to infinity which is accepted in so many shapes and applications as an unsurpassable ultimate at which thought, having reached this and so on to infinity, has usually achieved its end. This progress breaks out wherever relative determinations are pressed to the point of opposition, so that, though in inseparable unity, each is nevertheless attributed an independent existence over against the other. This progress is therefore the contradiction which is not resolved, but is rather always pronounced simply as present. All right, just uh, do a quick note for uh, my own sake so I can remember. Um, just as how uh, restriction the art, you know, where units of unities of limit and determination, uh, the movement towards the infinite and the finite is likewise a new level of unity between the art and restriction, which is in which the infinite is, from the perspective of the ought, over against the restriction, and the finite is, from the perspective of the restriction, over against the ought. So, uh, just keeping structures in mind. Yeah. All right, you ready to go on? Yeah. What we have before us is an abstract transcending, which remains incomplete because the transcending itself has not been transcended. Before us, we have the infinite. Of course, this infinite is transcended, for another limit is posited. But just because of that, only a return is instead made back to the finite. This bad infinite is in itself the same as the perpetual ought. It is indeed the negation of the finite, but in truth, it is unable to free itself from it. The finite constantly resurfaces in it as its other, since this infinite only is with reference to the finite, which is its other. The progress to infinity is therefore only repetitious monotony, the one and the same tedious alternation of this finite and infinite. Okay, keep going. Yep. The infinity of the infinite progress remains burdened by the finite as such, is thereby restricted, and is itself finite. In fact, however, it is thereby posited as the unity of the finite and the infinite. Only this unity is not reflected upon, yet it alone rouses the finite in the infinite and the infinite in the finite. It is, so to speak, the impulse driving the infinite progress. This progress is the outside of this unity at which representation remains fixated, fixated at that perennial repetition of one and the same alter alternation. At the empty unrest of a progression across the limit towards the infinite, which, in this infinity, finds a new limit, but is just as unable to halt it as it is at the infinite. This infinite has the rigid determination of a beyond that cannot be attained, for the very reason that it ought not be attained, since the determinateness of the beyond, of an existent determination uh, of an existent negation, has not been let go. In this determination, 
the infinite has the finite as uh, this side over against it. A finite that is likewise unable to raise itself up to the infinite just because it has this determination of an other, that is, of an existence that perennial, perennially regenerates itself in, it, in that beyond precisely by being different from it. All right, uh, yeah. we're going to go on to C next, so you should talk right now. Yeah, I don't, know. I don't think there's much to say. Yeah. Hegel's actually just suddenly getting pretty clear in like these this section. It's just like, you know, once we have all these other terms that we can now use, uh, it just seems like it just flows like normal speech on like prior parts. I don't know. I felt that was pretty clear. Uh, Ivan? Yeah. What do you think, Ivan? Ivan? Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay. It's, um, as I understood it, it's... Uh, yeah, he, he pretty much explains the na nature of the infinite and how, how it contains finite, uh, finite, uh, finite and uh, I don't know if I have some additional notes. And yeah, towards this end, we have this infinite, yeah, uh, yeah. In infinite like uh, regression from uh, uh, progression from finite to infinite and from infinite to finite. finite and yeah. Because it can't get rid of its finite because it's relying upon its finite. It's only infinite in relation to the finite. But we're about to go on from bad finite to affirmative infinity. All right, C, affirmative infinity. In this reciprocal determination of the finite and the infinite alternating back and forth, as just indicated, the truth of these two is already implicitly present in itself, and all that is needed is to take up what is in there. What is there? Uh, this back and forth movement constitutes the external realization of the concept in which the content of the latter is posited, but externally, as a falling out of the two. All that is needed is the comparing of these two different moments in which the unity is given, which the concept itself gives. Unity of the finite and the infinite. As has often been already noted, but must especially uh, be kept in mind at this juncture, is the uneven expression for the unity as it is in truth. But also the removal of this uneven determination must be found in the externalization of the concept that lies ahead of us. Taken in their first, only immediate determination, the infinite is the transcending of the finite, According to its determination, it is the negation of the finite. The finite, for its part, is only that which must be transcended. The negation in it of itself, and this is the infinite. In each, therefore, there is the determinateness of the other, whereas, according to the viewpoint of the infinite progression, the two should be mutually excluded and would have to follow one another only, alterna al only alternately. Neither can be posited and grasped without the other, the infinite without the finite, the finite without the infinite. In saying what the finite, what the infinite is, uh, namely the negation of the finite, the finite itself is said also. It cannot be avoided in the determination of the infinite. One need only know what is being said in order to find the determination of the finite in the infinite. Regarding the finite, it is readily conceded that it is the null, this very nothingness is, however, the infinite from which it is inseparable. Understood in this way, they may seem to be taken according to the way which the way each refers to its other. Taken without this connecting reference, and thus joined only through an and, they subsist independently, each only an existent over against the other. We have to examine how they would be constituted in this way. The infinite, thus, po uh, thus positioned, is one of the two, 
but on, uh, but as only one of them. It is itself finite. It is not the whole, but only one side. It has its limit in that which stands over against it, and so it is the finite infinite. We have before us only two finites. The finitude of the infinite, and therefore its unity with the finite, lies in the very fact that it is separated from the finite and placed, consequently, on one side. The finite, for its part, removed from the infinite and positioned for itself, is this self-reference, in which the relativity, its dependence and transitoriness, are removed. It is the same self-subsistence and self-affirmation which the infinite is presumed to be. Pretty clear, I think. Yeah. I had a note here for the last part, but if you wanted me to read it. All right. Uh, when we try to understand the infinite as finitized, or finiti finitized infinite, or infinitized infinite, or infinitized finite, sorry, uh, we are not understanding the infinite. The finite is finite through the infinite, and the infinite is finite through the... Or the infinite is infinite through the finite. It is an error to think that we are, uh, that they are different concepts all along. What is finitude without being in itself related to the infinite? It posits its own infinity, and the abstract finite is only finite by, posi by positing the infinite, uh, the infinite finite, sorry, the infinite against it. The infinity of the finite is its finitude, the moment of otherness. Hmm. That's from a long time ago, though. Yeah, I, I haven't been using my PDF from that time. Yeah, I need to be uh, updating. Because I, I didn't want to like have my old notes prejudice my fresh reading. Yeah. Well, I, at least I know I was right back then. <laughs> like, still... Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, it's pretty clear, but sorry I couldn't read my notes uh, very well because they, <laughs> like, they, they were line by line. I had to go down the small, small window. Hmm. What was that, Ivan? It was okay. It was okay. And don't worry. Oh, okay. thanks. All right, uh, next section, or next paragraph. The two pathways of consideration, even though they seem at first to have each a, di a different determinateness for their point of departure, the former inasmuch as it assumes it to be only the reference of infinite and finite to each other, of each to the other, and the latter their complete separation from, other, from each other, uh, yield one and the same result. The infinite and the finite, taken together as referring to each other in a connection, which is presumed external, but is in fact essential to them, for without it neither is what it is, each contains its other in its own determination. Just as, when each is taken for itself, when looked at it on its own terms, each has the other present in its own, in it as its own mo moment. Yeah, to, just to point that out is uh, the whole referring thing. Uh, especially regarding externality, in which uh, people say, well, you know, it's, it's, I'm just saying that, you know, referring to, to the finite. I'm not saying that the, the finite is part of the infinite. And, uh, you know, they consider it just an external thing, that, you know, the infinite here and the finite's over there. Uh, but Hegel's yeah. saying, like, look, just look at the way you have to say it. Like, the fact yeah. that you can't speak of the infinite without mentioning, oh, it's not the finite, is the imminent tell which lets you know this is absolutely tied to finitude. Like the concept mm -hmm. is it's not opposite. like the concept is not or, something that's truly like other. You know, they're not independent. Yeah. They're actually like very much in complete dialectical dependence. Yeah, it has to imply the other. Yeah, but uh, basically, it came. It came from from that movement because. Uh... Uh, we f first established it as separate for, from each other, as I understood. 
yeah, going from the assumption, the regular assumption, uh, which it's not his movement, but it's him talking about it because that's what people will normally think about. So he's blocking at the beginning. It's just like how the, with something or another, we started with an external consideration, which isn't what his own consideration is. So, you know, the whole talk about, well, you know, normal we consider them outside each other. That's just against the normal notion. It's his real notion is this unity between both in which both the, the real infinite is basically this the unity of both moments of the art and the restriction. All right. Uh, this yields then the scandalous unity of the finite and the infinite. The unity which is itself the infinite that embraces both itself and the finite the infinite, therefore, understood in a sense other than when the finite is separated from it and placed on the other side from it. Since they must now be now also be distinguished, each is within it, as just shown, itself the unity of both. There are thus two such unities. The common element, the unity of both determinacies, as such a unity, posits them at first as negated, for each is to be what is what it is in being distinguished. In their unity, therefore, they lose their qualitative nature. An important reflection for, the counter for countering the incorrigible habit of representing the infinite and the finite in their unity as still holding on to the quality that they, would have, that they would have when taken apart from each other. Of seeing in that unity, therefore, nothing except contradiction and not also the resolution of the contradiction by the negation of the qualitative determinateness of each. And so is the unity of the infinite and the finite, at first simple and universal, falsified. But further, since the two are now taken to be also as distinguished, the unity of the finite, which is itself, uh, sorry, the unity of the infinite, which is itself both of these moments, is determined differently in each. The infinite, determined as such, has in it the finitude which is distinct from it. In this unity, the infinite is the in itself, while the finite is only determinateness, the limit in the infinite. But such a limit is the absolute other of the infinite, its opposite. The infinite's determination, which is the in itself as such, is corrupted by being saddled with a quality of this sort. The infinite is thus a finitized infinite. Likewise, since the finite is as such only the non in itself, but equally has its opposite in it by virtue of the said unity, it is elevated above its worth and, so to speak, infinitely elevated. It is posited as the infinitized finite. So I think that's just a pretty damn good turn of phrase. It doesn't matter which way we come at it, it's the same, the same thing, basically. Yeah. Okay, likewise, just as the sample, uh, sorry, just as the simple unity of infinite and finite was falsified before by the understanding, so too is the double unity. Here also this happens because the infinite is taken in one of the two unities, not as negated, but rather as the in itself in which, therefore, determinateness and restriction should not be posited, for they would debase and corrupt it. Conversely, the finite is equally held fixed as not negated, although null in itself, so that in combination with the infinite, it is elevated to what it is not and is, uh, and is thereby infinitized, notwithstanding its determination that has not vanished, but is rather perpetuated. The falsification that the understanding penetrates with respect to the finite and the infinite. Oh, sorry. Wow, really? Okay. The falsification that the understanding perpetrates with respect to the finite and the infinite of holding their reciprocal reference fixed as qualitative differentiation, of maintaining that their determination is separate, indeed, absolutely separate, comes from forgetting what for the, what for the understanding itself is the concept of these moments. 
According to this concept, the unity of the finite and the infinite is not an external bringing together of them, nor an incongruous combination that goes against their nature, one, of which, one in which uh, inherently separate and opposed terms that exist independently or are consequently incompatible would be knotted together. Rather, each is itself this unity, and this is only a, as a sublating of itself in which neither of them have a... Uh, yeah, neither would have an advantage over the other in its in itselfness and affirmative existence. As has earlier been shown, finitude is only as a transcending of itself. It is therefore within it that the infinite, the other of itself, is contained. Similarly, the infinite is only as the transcending of the finite. It therefore contains its other essentially, and it is thus within it that it is the other of itself. The finite is not sublated by the infinite, as by a power present outside it. Its infinity consists rather in sublating itself. Highlight that, because that is obviously right. the key point. Or copy-paste that, save it, whatever. It's, that's basically it. But the, the last sentence, the finity is not sublated by its infinite as by power present outside, outside it, its infinity consists rather in sublating itself. That uh, the art of the finite, you know, which is thought to be the infinite, uh, isn't something that's actually outside the finite. It's literally, it's always been there. It yeah. is what the finite is. You know, it's part of what yeah. it is. To be finite is to have an art beyond you that the odd is not something separate from the finite it it is immediately part of the finite already yeah it has and to it be. has to be infinite you know it's like being being in itself you know there has to be a being for other it's not something external like it's constitutive of the very thing itself so to be finite is has to be constituted by this otherness of the infinite already being part of the finite itself and likewise, the infinite already has the otherness of the finite within itself. It's not something alien to it. All right, I highlighted and I made a note that this is a key section of the about infinity. All right. The sublating is not, consequently, alteration or otherness in general, not the sublating of something. That into which the finite is sublated is the infinite as the negating of finitude. But the latter has long since been only existence, determined as a non-being. It is only the negation, therefore, that the, in the negation sublates itself. Thus infinity is determined on its side as the negative of the finite and thereby of determinateness in general, as an empty beyond. Its sublating of itself into the finite is a return from an empty flight, the negation of the beyond, which is inherently a negative. Present in both, therefore, is the same negation of negation, but this negation of negation is in itself self-reference, affirmation, but as turning back to itself, that is, through the mediation that the negation of negation is, these are the determinations that, is, that it is essential to bring to view. The second point, however, is that in the infinite progression, they are also posited, and how they are posited therein, namely, not in their ultimate truth. First, both are negated in that progression, the infinite as well as the finite. Both are equally transcended. Second, they are also posited as distinct, one after the other, each positive for itself. We sort out these two determinations while comparing them, just as in the comparison, in an external comparing, we have separated the two ways of considering them, the finite and the infinite as referring to one another, and each taken for itself. The infinite progression, however, says more than this. Also posited in it, though at first still only as transition and alteration, alternation, uh, is the connectedness of the terms being distinguished. We now only need to see, in one simple reflection, what is in fact present in it.
In the first place, the negation of the finite and the infinite, which is posited in the infinite progression, can be taken as simple, and hence as mutually, uh, mutual externality, only a following of one upon the other. Starting from the finite, the limit is thus transcended, the finite negated. We now have its beyond, the infinite. But in this, the limit rises up again. So we have the transcending of the infinite. This twofold sublation is nonetheless partly only an external event and an alternating of moments in general, and partly still posited as one unity. Each of these moves beyond, uh, beyond is an in independent starting point, a fresh act, so that the two fall apart. But in addition, their connection is also present in the infinite progression. The finite comes first, then there is the transcending of it, and this negative, or this beyond of the finite, is the infinite. Third, this negation is transcended in turn. A new limit comes up, a finite again. This is the complete, self-closing movement that has arrived at that which made the beginning. What emerges is the same as that from which the departure was made. That is, the finite is restored. The latter has therefore rejoined itself in its beyond and has only found itself again. So that's, uh, that's one of the key relations of all Hegelian logic, you know, it's going beyond is only mm -hmm. return back to itself. You know, nothing is ultimately truly alien. Yeah. So yeah, we got like from from just finite, we got finite that it has con is containing infinite in itself, as her previous moments. Yeah. And it reaches out for the infinite, grasps it, returns to finitude, and that's the full circle. And yeah, it's ne next section. It's pretty clear that uh, in, in the same case, he establishes infinite like that, and that's why this this is full affirmative infinite. If I'm, I'm correct. Yeah. The same is the case regarding the infinite. In the infinite, in the beyond of the limit, only a new limit arises, which has the same fate, namely that is finite must be negated. Thus what is again at hand is the same infinite that just now disappeared in the new limit. By being sublated, by traversing the new limit, the finite has not therefore advanced one jot further. It has distanced itself neither from the finite, uh, for the infinite is, uh, for the finite is just this, to pass over into the infinite, nor from itself, for it has arrived at itself. Thus the finite and the infinite are both this movement of each returning to itself through its negation. They are only as implicit mediation, and the affirmative of each contains the negative of each, and is the negation of the negation. They are thus a result, and as such, not in the determination that they had at the beginning. Neither is the finite an existence on its side, nor the infinite an existence, or a being in itself beyond that existence, that is, beyond existence in the determination of finitude. So just something to note there, I mean, uh, yeah. I think it's, uh, it highlights the importance of it. So where he says, thus the finite and the infinite are both this movement of each returning to itself through its negation. So, I mean, what is it that we found out of, ever, out of everything so far? It's actually always been a movement. You know, what was being? It was the movement to nothing. What was nothing? It was the movement to being. You know, was, what was their truth? What was the truth of so, like? of a you know it seems to be static being well it was becoming the truth of being was becoming and that's the truth of pretty much everything from then on you know it's always been the truth of things has always been a movement every time you think you have something that's stable the reality is it's always moving yeah i think that's like uh, a great a great part because if you look at like how science deals with nature, for example, they always consider that it's uh, what is being researched is static. It 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 doesn't evolve. It's just 
Yeah, yeah, and like the mistake people would make here is thinking that this is talking about you know physical movement, but no, this is talking about movement in total, movement as, as all kinds. I, I, I mean, like like tel teleology or or something like that. If we we can say. Yeah, things are also like theological. They have they have ends towards which they move, you know, but they're not like externally like given ends. So they're ends which are given from within already. Or not given, but rather generated from within, you know, it's not So the movements we're talking here are thought movements, but you know, when you start talking about like more concrete things, we're still talking about movements. Yeah, yeah. They're built upon themselves because we start if at first when we started logic we started with pure pure thought and then we advanced, we didn't put anything external in it. Yeah. They, yeah. they are in some in some sense at this moment they are dependent on all previous movements, so Yeah. Alright, keep going. Alright. The understanding strongly resists the unity of the finite and the infinite only because it presupposes restriction and finitude to remain like being in itself, constants. It thereby overlooks the negation of both, which is in fact present in the infinite progression, just as it equally overlooks that the two occur in this progression only as moments of a whole, that each emerges only through the mediation of its opposite, but essentially, equally, by means of the sublation of its opposite. Yeah, sublation if, here, uh, meaning obviously that it contains its opposite. You know. Yeah. If this imminent turning back has for the moment been reckoned to be just as much the turning back of the finite to itself and of the infinite to itself, noticeable in this very result is an error connected with the one-sidedness just criticized. The finite and then the infinite is each taken as the starting point. And only in this way, two results ensue. But it is a matter of total indifference which is taken as the starting point, and, with this, the distinction caused by the duality of results dissolves of itself. This is likewise posited in the line... Okay, yeah. I mean, that's an important point, uh, because it's something yeah, it also important for Hegel's whole philosophy. The truth of the, of the matter is, and Hegel says it himself, there is no beginning. There is no actual, like, legitimate beginning to the logic, yeah. there's actually no legitimate beginning to anything in the system. You could literally begin anywhere, and if you did yeah. things right, it would always produce the entire system no matter what. Like, the whole issue of the beginning for us, like, uh, as far as, like, de developing the science, is merely one about ease and, and, you know, usefulness of pragmatic issues, you know. You know, we just start with the most immediate and abstract just because that's going to make it a lot, a lot easier for us to just not assume things or, or not be assuming things which might be problematic. But otherwise, th there is no beginning. Like you, don't, you don't have to begin. It's not that being really is the beginning of everything. It isn't. This is likewise posited in the line of the infinite progression, open-ended on both sides, wherein each of the moments recurs in equal alternation. And it is totally extraneous, at which position the progression is arrested and taken as beginning. The moments are distinguished in the progression, but each is equally only moment of the other. Since both, the finite and the infinite, are themselves moments of the progression, they are jointly the, inf uh, jointly the finite, and since they are equally jointly negated in it, and in the result, this result is the neg Th this result, as the negation of their joint finitude, is called, with truth, the finite, or sorry, the infinite. Their distinction is thus the double meaning which they both have. The finite has the double meaning, first, of being the finite over against the infinite, which stands over against it, and second, of being at the same time the finite and the infinite over against the infinite. Also, the infinite has the double meaning of being one of the two moments. It is then the bad infinite, and of being the infinite in which the two moments, itself and its other, are only moments. Therefore, as in fact we, have, we now have it, uh, the nature of the infinite is that it is the process 
in which it lowers itself to be only one of its determinations over against the finite, and therefore itself only one of the finites, and elevates this distinction of itself and itself to be self-affirmation, and through this mediation, the true infinite. This determination of the true infinite cannot be captured in the already criticized formula of a unity of the finite and the infinite. Unity is abstract, motionless self-sameness, and the moments are likewise unmoved, likewise unmoved beings. But like both of its moments, the infinite is rather essentially only as becoming, though a becoming now further determined in its moments. Becoming has for its determinations first abstract being and nothing, as alteration. It has existence, something and other. Now as infinite, it has finite and infinite, these two themselves as in becoming. So, right, that catches out one of the fundamental things. Is Hegel a philosopher Anything? being? Fuck, no. What? Did you hear me? I said, I, it sounded really fast. <laughs> I heard yeah, from yeah. fuck not, yes, just that. Oh, Is Hegel a so. philosopher being fuck not? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, it's very clear Hegel does not care about being he's not heidegger oh yeah you know hegel isn't asking what is being he's like i don't care <laughs> <laughs> it's also not it's not also it's also not that you know becoming is like the, the most important category it's just like it's really the the basic form of what the the absolute essentially is yeah But uh, that's definitely something interesting. You know, the true infinite isn't a thing. It's a movement. So, you know, yeah. to define it, uh, when people want, you know, what is the definition of the absolute? Uh, actually, the, it, the absolute can't have a, a real definition. Its whole definition is to always go beyond definitions. Yeah. It's the beyond the self-transcendence of all things. All right. Uh, this infinite, as being turned back in, back unto itself, as reference of itself to itself, is being, but not indeterminate abstract being, for it is posited as negating the negation. Consequently, it is also existence or thereness. All right. There's a footnote. Um, I'm glossing in thereness in order to retain Hegel's subsequent play on words. Okay. Uh, there's another footnote that says the ideal, das ideale, has a broader meaning, such as of the beautiful and its associations, rather uh, than the idealized, das ideale. Uh, the former does not belong here yet, and for this reason the expression idealized is being used. There is no such distinction made in language usage for reality. In German, reale and reale are used as roughly synonymous and no interest is served in nuancing the two in some sort of opposition. All right. Uh, yeah. Consequently, it is also existence or thereness. For it contains negation in general and consequently determinateness. It is and is there present before us. Only the bad infinite is the beyond, since it is only the negation of the finite posited as real, and as such, it is abstract first negation, thus determined only as negative. It does not have the affirmation of existence in it. Held fast only as something negative, it ought not be, not to be there. It ought to be un unattainable. Yeah, it's just interesting. Cause, mm -hmm. cause this hits on like what most people like. It's the overwhelming consensus of people in philosophy uh, today, and just well, it's common people. The idea that infinity does not exist, that it, that it's merely a fiction of our minds. 
So, you know, infinity is this concept which is supposed to be one of the greatest, grandest concepts of the mind, you know, it's mysterious in all its ways. But at the same time, it's, yeah. you know, the lowest thing, which, you know, it's, it's so great, it doesn't exist. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. Uh, okay. However, to be thus unattainable is not its grandeur, but rather its defect, which is at bottom the result of holding fast to the finite as such, as existent. It is the untrue which is the unattainable. And what must be recognized is that such an infin infinite is the untrue. The image of the progression in infinity is the straight line. The latter, oh, sorry. The infinite is only at the two limits of this line. And always only is where the latter, which is existence, is not, but transcends itself in its non-existence. That is, in the, de in the indeterminate. As true infinite, bent back upon itself, its image becomes the circle, the line that has reached itself, closed and wholly present, without beginning and end. Wow. That's very That's good perfect. analogy. That is, like, perfect. Yeah. Where's the starting point of a circle? It doesn't have one. Because it's closed. Like that, if the ends were the, the <laughs> infinite, uh, you know, both you know the positive and the negative end, well, in a circle, it's always or it's always there and not there, <laughs> just like the yeah. infinite. I also had a point about the whole. Uh, he says, uh, "To be thus unattainable is not its grandeur, but rather its defect." And um, I think that goes with, uh, yeah, like the things I was saying in which. Uh, like perfection, you know, things people people complain it's like, well, you know, the world isn't perfect, and nothing in the world is perfect. And uh, I mean, this is one of the things I had like when I first began like taking philosophy classes, which is, wait a minute, then why the hell are we talking about perfection? You know, if perfection doesn't exist, how can it be perfect? How does that make sense? You know, it's the same thing. Like, you know, if infinity doesn't uh, exist, you know, how does it make sense to be talking about it? You know, why do we judge things yeah, according to it? So, you know, when you really take those things into account, I think, like, you know, you definitely do see the defect of these concepts uh, in this abstracted uh, static form. Doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, just to, like, say one last little bit about that, which is, yeah, it'd sure. be like saying that, you know, if nobody's perfect, then perfection itself isn't perfect. Because, uh, yeah, I'd agree with the scholastics here. Uh, actually existing is definitely a perfection. Mm -hmm. All right. True infinity, thus taken in general as existence, posited as affirmative in contrast to abstract negation, is reality in a higher sense than it was earlier, as simply determined. It has now obtained a concrete content. It is not the infinite, sorry, it is not the finite which is the real, but rather the infinite. Thus, reality is further determined as essence, concept, idea, and so forth. In connection with the more concrete, it is, however, superfluous to repeat such earlier and more abstract categories as reality, and to use them for determinations more concrete than they are by themselves. Such a repetition, as when it is said that essence or, the con or that the concept is real, has its origin in the fact that to uneducated thought, the most abstract categories such as being, existence, reality, finitude, are the most familiar. Yes, yeah, so I mean, it's a uh, bas basic pointing out uh, for Hegel, like, you know, it's for most people in the regular, the regular common understanding, it's the more basic and abstract it is, the more concrete they think it is. You know, it's uh, the things which constitute higher things are therefore, you know, things which are most subjective or more, most real. So reality would be more real than essence. And for Hegel, it's like, that's stupid. Because, it's a, yeah, yeah, it has reality, but, you know, it has more than reality. As a matter of fact, the fact that you have to make this other layer just shows you how much more real than reality it is.
So to say, well, you know, essence is real is to miss the point that essence is so far beyond reality already. I can I can see why he says it. I mean, it's, it's a, a pretty artistic, linguistic, and uh, kind of a technical point, but uh, it's a true point. You know, to to speak about essence is already to be speaking about realities. So you know, to say it's a real essence, it's it's uh, you know like pointing to say like point at something and say you know this ice cream cone is an ice cream cone cone being an ice cream cone. Uh, you, you're wasting <laughs> breath. Yeah. Yeah, right. Keep going. The more immediate occasion, however, for recalling here the categories of reality is that the negation against which reality is the affirmative is here the negation of negation and consequently itself posited over against that reality which finite which finite existence is negation is thus determined as ideality the idealized is the infinite is the finite as it is in the true infinite as a determination a content a distinct but not a subs uh, subsistent existent a moment rather Ideality has this more concrete signification, which is not fully expressed through the negation of finite existence. As regards reality and ideality, the opposition of finite and infinite is, however, so grasped that the finite assumes the value of the real, whereas the infinite that of the idealized. In the same way, further on, also the concept is regarded as an idealization that is, a mere idealization, in contrast to existence in general, which is regarded as the real. When contrasted in this way, it is, of course, of no use to have reserved for the said concrete determination of negation the distinctive expression of idealization. In that opposition of finite and infinite, we are back to the one-sidedness of the abstract negative characteristic of the bad infinite and still fixed in the affirmative existence of the finite. So that's another reversal of Hegel's, you know, people would think it's the infinite, which is ideal, you know, so the idealization of the thing doesn't really exist. And for Hegel, it's like, I mean, he thinks he's proved it. And uh, I agree that uh, it's actually the inverse. It's the finite, which is ide actually ideal. <laughs> it's not the infinite. Yeah. But yeah, I think that this is where we'll leave it off. Uh, we can discuss uh, right. questions. Uh, Ivan? You don't want to see the Real quick. A what? The transition's short. No, but it's followed by two remarks. Uh, I think it'll be yeah. better if we just leave it there and uh, do it first. All right. Yeah, we might want to go over what we went over this time. Briefly before the transition, though. Yeah, I don't know. For being like such a one of the pretty much the core concept, which is like the real thing, which everything else uh, is finally going to fully embody over and over again. Um, this was actually probably the clearest it has been in the logic up to now. Like, I think compared to the finite as such, like, this made, this was so much easier. I mean, it's literally just, like, exactly what he says. I don't see how anybody could miss out on, like, what this means. Like, you could literally open this without having read anything before that, and I think it would still make pretty much <laughs> perfect sense. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, but still, when you you, you can just take one part, and it's uh, so, so, some parts are incredibly complicated, and some parts are incredibly uh, straightforward, uh, written straightforward.
but yeah, it uh, seems to like uh, um, uh, I, I, I'm getting more and more uh, to see like the stru structure, structure in higher sense of it because. Uh, I, I, at least I feel with this chapter that we get at some uh, uh, goal, some end, or something like that. Oh yeah, this is the the first. Uh, the chapters are structured as chapters because they have a a certain structure they play out. So, you know, in being we had a certain structure. Here we had a certain the whole reflective structure. Uh, the next chapter is completely new to me, so uh, I'm kind of excited definitely to see what the structure of that one will be, because uh, it will definitely have to be different compared to the reflective structures of existence. Okay guys, it's 3 in the morning at my place, I'm going to sleep. Alright man, All right. thanks for staying up with us. No problem, bye. Yeah, yeah. Bye. See you next week.